the concept of Qigong is, uh, is basically like Reiki, but you're doing Reiki onto yourself. So you're using your own, uh, through your breath and movement, you're basically renovating the energetic field of the body. Humongous misunderstanding of how to feed our bodies in the West. Mm -hmm. um, according to our body types too, because everyone has different body types. Mm -hmm. So it's quite difficult to, you know, to prescribe someone the same diet. Welcome to this new episode and today we are in the beautiful village of Pai in northern Thailand and with me I have Juan. How are you Juan? Very good, how are you? Very very good indeed. So Juan is a teacher and practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine mm. and an individual who spent many years in China. So I'm very excited to learn more about TCM. Uh, but first of all I'd like to ask you, what is your story in life up until now? Basically, when I, uh, I mean, I was born in Venezuela in 1988, so I'm quite young. But fortunately, in um, the year 2000, my family left to the States to escape from Chavez, you know, the revolution. And we ended up living in the States for, I, I ended up staying there for six years, graduated from high school, and then went straight to China. When I was 18, I went to China, fell in love with a Chinese girl, and that's why I got kind of stuck in China and I started learning the language and eventually got to the point after like a year or two that I didn't want to go back. I just decided to stay in China for as long as possible. And that ended up being until December of 2021. But in between that, a lot of things have happened, you know. So it's hard to, uh, in only a short amount of time, it's hard to describe all the little things that have happened in that time. And uh, I mean, this uh, interest in China, I mean, is something that you kind of grew up with or it just happened? Well, my grandmother, it's all because of her. She was the first Miss Venezuela in 1949. Wow. And after she, she uh, won the beauty contest in Venezuela, um, she ended up uh, continuing, uh, she continued to study anthropology and archaeology. And after that, she went to like a hundred different countries in the world to study each culture that she she traveled during the 50s 60s 70s she was traveling like 200 plus countries writing books on different ethnic groups in like Myanmar or in New Guinea or, and then finally she always wanted to go to China but China was going through the cultural revolution at the time mm -hmm. so the whole country was closed and you're only allowed to go in if you're some kind of diplomat or some you know someone important so she made this kind of a, she wrote this letter, an imaginary letter to Zhou Enlai, which was the premier of China at the time, but okay. as a joke. And someone grabbed the letter and sent it to the Chinese embassy in London. They were living in London at the time. So the, the, the embassy sent it to China and three months later, a letter from Zhou Enlai came inviting her to China. So, so she took that opportunity to go and travel around China for like two months, and then wrote a book on her experience. So because of her, my aunt was always jealous. She always also wanted to go to, to China. And it didn't happen until 2005. And that's when I got invited to travel with her. So that's why I, otherwise I wouldn't, my China was not on my radar until then, right? So yeah. I wouldn't have gone to China for, un, unless that would have happened. And I really like the fact that you said, you know, you fell in love with a Chinese girl when you went there. Is that right, yeah? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's China is an interesting country because you don't expect, I mean, I didn't expect to stay more than a couple of months. And then I ended up staying 15, 16 years. It's just like the, the, the gravity is like the center of gravity of their culture just sucked me in. And I was like, wow, okay, 
I'm gonna go in for a ride here, you know. Um, so yeah, I did uh, end up falling in love with a Chinese girl and had a relationship with her for around three years, which was very interesting to see, understand the culture from a romantic point of view, because that's when you really start to understand uh, the dynamic, what's going on inside. The cultural conditioning is very strong in China. They mm. have this kind of 2000 year old Confucianist uh, conditioning, you know? So it's very tricky to, to be in a relationship with a Chinese woman, but y I learned a lot through it. And, uh, and then I had other relationships as well. So it's a beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting indeed. You know, I spent uh, one month in China myself uh, in 2008 and it is a very fascinating country, very different from uh, sort of, you know, the Western uh, kind of uh, backgrounds that we come from because of mm, course uh, Venezuela is South American and uh, I was in Colombia, I traveled in South America mm. and it feels a lot more similar to Europe in many, many ways, yeah. uh, particularly if uh, compared to uh, Asia and China indeed. And uh, I mean, traditional Chinese medicine again came to you like that so you no that's another like many many years later i was in china I, I was actually traveling through india and nepal at the time in 2015 it was my first time in uh, nepal second time in india i got uh, sick um i had to deal with this uh like stomach problems for like two three years waking up every day mm -hmm. um at like you know five in the morning every time so in finally, after trying everything, I went two years like that, after trying everything like Tibetan medicine, Thai, Ayurvedic, Chinese, medi uh, like uh, herbal medicine, nothing ever really worked. The problem would just kind of go away for a bit and then come back. Okay. I didn't know what to do with that situation until mm -hmm. I found my, my teacher with a Chilean acupuncturist in, in China. And through basically acupuncture and bleeding, he healed me. So that was like a big, like, whoa, wow, this is quite interesting, this stuff. Because before that, I always had this kind of skeptical view of acupuncture and, and traditional Chinese medicine. And after that, I, was, I, I understood it for what it was. No? So I started mm. having much more interest and I went deep in to try to understand what, what healed me exactly. It wasn't, I didn't need any, anything external, it was all happening inside through the, uh, you know, the chi, the meridians or the blood. So yeah, it was a very interesting revelation um, that started my trip to uh, this, you know, tradition. And what you say is fascinating and it's uh, kind of uh, common in a way among uh, teachers, healers, uh, very often they have a problem themselves yeah, they try exactly. to fix that one and then they realize that you know they you know they want to learn more and more and more about uh, you know healing and uh, and particularly Chinese medicine being such a large uh, you know uh, body of, of knowledge is one of the, mm, yeah. the, the sort of major medicinal systems in the world right I mean theoretically speaking we shouldn't call it Chinese medicine we should call it ancient medicine because uh, I mean if you're a historian you know that um, uh, for example Western civilization was basically destroyed by uh, you know Christianity and is Islam so we only have like two percent of the books that remain from that humongous collection of uh, knowledge of our ancestors right the mm -hmm. Greeks and the Romans the Persians the, the Egyptians all that was just lost within a couple hundred years. Uh, India had the same problem. Uh, Islam invaded India and, you know, they took care of them. Um, in Central America and in, in Peru, the Spanish came and destroyed everything too. So the, the biggest repository of human knowledge from the ancient times is still in China, mm -hmm. Japan, Korea. And it's a very direct tradition coming all the way from the caveman years, you mm -hmm. know, because the Chinese characters are literally just caveman drawings that became stylized over time. So when you see a Chinese character, what you're seeing is a caveman painting that it now it doesn't look like a caveman painting, but it, it comes from that. No? So originally, like the character for a, for water or for the mountain or a river looked exactly like a, like a river or a mountain or something like that. Eventually, it started becoming more stylized. So. Yeah, that's part of my journey, 
is to make people understand this stuff, right? Because mm -hmm. we come from a very Eurocentric tradition. Mm -hmm. And uh, just kind of to switch the board and make people understand that maybe they don't know anything at all and that mm -hmm. maybe we should listen to these guys who've been doing it for thousands and thousands of years and they have perfect efficiency in treating certain cases that Western medicine doesn't know how to treat, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just to try to be more humble in, the, in, in respect to the Chinese uh, ancient knowledge. What you say is really fascinating indeed, and of course there's also the humors, you know, the four humors in, uh, in, uh, in Western uh, ancient yeah. medicine it's that uh, there's very little left of it, I suppose, and I don't know anybody that actually uh, as a Practices. yeah I don't know maybe you know somebody but it's very rare right uh, to see anybody mm -hmm. that has any knowledge uh, or any practice around what used to be uh, the medicinal system of ancient European times and uh, mm -hmm. as you said you know with uh, certainly you know Persian and, and Arab uh, uh, so influences etc but Chinese medicine is uh, very well and, and thriving in China but also abroad right mm. is that true that one of your uh, missions is uh, sort of to spread uh, the knowledge a little bit uh, in, yeah. in the West as well of course I mean I was just coming in from Mexico and Guatemala Peru Venezuela and I was practicing in all these places and then, uh, you know trying to create more awareness bringing people more understanding of this stuff um, my work is solely done through donations, so I'm not really into it just because I, it's not important whether I make money or not. Of course, it's good to survive, you know, but it's not the mission. Um, for me, it's more important to create that awareness, to make people understand that there is an alternative and that it's kind of miraculous the way it works. Uh, maybe it doesn't work for it's the same. Like, I wouldn't give the same medicine to everyone, but... Yeah. Um, it's such a vast field of knowledge anyway that that it's very hard to find a case that is not gets better most cases get like 90 or plus percent of people get better or he heal themselves through this tradition and also uh, it's it, it's um, 5,000 years of knowledge so it's quite complicated it, there's not just one tradition right okay there's uh, hundreds of different school systems so it takes forever, like I, one lifetime for sure is not enough to, to even begin to understand this knowledge. Mm -hmm. I only know one branch of it, you know, one small tradition. And uh, I know uh, like, like the, the mainstream cons uh, idealization, but the tradition I work with is more the Tung method. Tung. Which is a uh, master Tung, uh, is a Taiwanese, I mean, he's originally from Shandong province, but they fled th uh, because of the Cultural Revolution. Yeah. I mean, uh, because of the great, uh, the Chinese, the communists took over China before. Sure, sure, sure. And the court at the time uh, found refuge in Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. So that tradition, I mean, uh, uh, one of the things that people should know when they're talk uh, understanding about uh, anything about traditional Chinese medicine is that um, TCM, like the official TCM, was kind of created by the Communist Party. They, uh -huh. they did a massive drive of simplification. So they simplified the language, they simplified uh, um, many of the branches of medicine as well, and including Chinese medicine. So before that, before the communism, there was thousands of different schools and most of them disappeared. No one knows what they were. Mm -hmm. So fortunately enough, this one tradition survived in Taiwan. And it's more of an esoteric spiritual tradition quite interesting, the backstory of it. Uh, Quan, there are uh, different uh, types of uh, practices within uh, the larger container of uh, Chinese medicine. Yeah. You already mentioned uh, that uh, even, uh, uh, you know, there are different branches, if you want, or traditions within the tradition. Yeah. But can you tell us what are sort of the main practices that uh, you have knowledge of and you offer to clients? Um, the way that uh, uh, the tr our tradition works is through bleeding. Basically, uh, a lot of the problems can be resolved by bleeding patients. Um, a lot of conditions have their origin in the blood condition. So maybe some impurities in the blood or, you know, uh, to extract blood is very useful in these kind of certain conditions. And uh, uh, combined with a diagnostic, you know, to see what was the problem of the person you can really get down like pretty accurate understanding of what the person is suffering and how to treat each condition and also 
the points are very different from traditional Chinese medicine. There's less points in the Tung method. Um, a lot of them are in the hands. Yeah, the, it's very strange logic, but it works more efficiently than the official traditional Chinese medicine, according to what I've felt, you know, from my experience. Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, each tradition has its pros and cons. I also can like to borrow from other traditions. I still use a lot of the mainstream points of TCM. I use some of the abdominal acupuncture points. So it depends. I'm not uh, an extremist or a sectarian, you know. I think everything kind of has a place in the order of of the universe. So it's not uh, it's not a right to to discriminate, right? Or to be prejudiced. I think everything has its place. Okay, so you're saying bleeding and there's acupuncture, of course, that most people are uh, familiar with. And also, I think you practice Qigong, is that right? Qigong was an earlier journey for me. Qigong, I started in 2010. At that time, I was very, um, how do you call it? I was really into uh, understanding the spirit and trying to really connect with my Atman, so like the, the Hindu concept of Atman. It's a kind of a super ego and trying to uh, purify myself through a, a certain tradition. So I, I tried yoga, didn't really get too, in, too far with the yoga, but once I, I started doing Qigong, it was like clear channel. It was a very powerful practice. So powerful, in fact, that I don't practice it every day because it's very ungrounding for me. Uh -huh. It's a very airy practice. Uh, my teacher, of course, he says that, uh, that uh, I just have to continue doing it, but. Uh, you know, for <laughs> maybe, maybe I still haven't gotten to the level where I can bring all that energy back into the ground. So I practice it, let's say like five, six times a, uh, a month. And sometimes in special cases, I, I do like a whole, you know, like uh, from new moon to full moon kind of practice and teach workshops. And I've done that in different countries, also in, in uh, India and in Thailand, I've did a, did a few twice in Thai actually. Uh, but anyway, uh, the concept of Qigong is, uh, is basically like Reiki, but you're doing Reiki onto yourself. So you're using your own, uh, through your breath and movement, you're basically renovating the energetic field of the body. And uh, it's quite a powerful meditation anyway. Sure, sure. I, I tried, of course, Qigong, um, also Tai Chi, and also I tried uh, maybe a few times uh, something called Falun Gong, Falun which is Gong actually currently it. banned in China. Let's not get into it. No, why but not? It's, uh, but it's very interesting. I actually, amongst the, the, uh, all of them, I think Falun Gong is the one that I resonated with the most. Mm. I remember once I was in Kopangan, there was this um, South African practitioner, uh, there was also an activist of sorts, and he was teaching this uh, Falun Gong on the beach. And I did the Falun Gong, and then I did one hour of Hatha Yoga afterwards and my hatha yoga practice i felt like i was flying literally yeah, yeah, you know exactly. and for people that don't really resonate with uh, with uh, with chi or energy uh, i mean it's it's fantastic the minute that you mm. start uh, you know discovering this aspect of yourself everybody has it yeah. you know you can think of vitality you can think of a uh, life force itself right Prana or electric current flowing through so. i always see it like as an electric current or and we're just channeling that electricity through our bodies. So uh, if you are doing more meditation or Qigong or through acupuncture, because acupuncture is a similar concept. One of the meridians is blocked. Like the ele electric circuit of the body is blocked. So you're trying to activate it to remind the body where the point is. So, it's, you know, there's different ways to the same center. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily you have to do acupuncture to get there. If you're doing Qigong every day, I'm sure you don't need acupuncture. Mm -hmm. Or the same with ayahuasca, for example. One of my experiences with ayahuasca was all my body was buzzing with the electric current, like energy, prana. You know, and it was very, very similar to the experience I had I have with acupuncture. It's just much more, you know, the magnitude of it was like 10, 100 times more. But it's getting the same thing done through a different gate. So it's very interesting. Okay, okay, very interesting indeed. And uh, I mean, if you have a healthy, thriving chi, or like your life force is very sort of healthy, it's difficult to get sick. 
Yeah. Is that right? So the body kind of follows the energy a little bit and the energy follows the body or what's, what's the most uh, important aspect of us in your opinion? I don't think, I think everyone will get sick eventually, it's just a matter of time, but the, uh, the recovery rate is much quicker mm -hmm. because your immune system is like, you know, it's prepared. I don't think it's, it's healthy not to be sick for too long too, because then you get sick and you get really sick. You're kind of, kind of avoiding, you know, sometimes I think to have a strong immune system is more important than not to be sick. Um, but through acupuncture or through uh, herbal medicines, you recover your recovery rate is sometimes 50 or 75 percent quicker than normally. You know, okay. also through dieting. I think dieting is the most important part. That's the the subject matter that I tried to, and that's another thing I forgot to add, was that uh, we have a humongous misunderstanding of how to feed our bodies in the West mm -hmm. um, according to our body types too because everyone has different body types mm -hmm. so it's quite difficult to you know to prescribe someone the same diet and also without the understanding of traditional Chinese medicine diet it's very it's we're lacking a humongous it's like we're missing out on a humongous part of this uh, understanding of dieting if we don't look at what the Chinese have been doing. Because that, uh, like I said, they, they are the biggest repository of uh, ancient knowledge and experience for 5,000 consecutive years. Um, and they have it all written down precisely what food does what, what it doesn't do, you know, what we should eat in the morning, what we should eat in the you know, lunch, what we should eat at dinner, the seasonal changes, you know, what we should sure. eat in each season. And no one knows any of this stuff. For me, it's like, it's crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, from a philosophical perspective, uh, or like spiritual, uh, I mean, Taoism is part of a Chinese medicine as well. Taoism became a religion, mm -hmm. but it originally was not a religion, it's just the way. So uh, let's say that the ancient Chinese people are so connected to the understanding of the land that they didn't even need to create anything. They, they were very informed of the way. The way is just the, um, you know, this relationship between the heaven and the earth and man's place in between. So they're basically channeling, channelers of divine wisdom. So in China, the, the biggest problem now is the lack of understanding. China also has the same problem as the West, but from a different point of view. They're so immersed in their own cultural traditions that they can't really look beyond that. Okay. They don't have a connection to the ancient past anymore. They're just kind of reading over and over again different like less quality versions of their past so um, yeah that's another problem that uh, that is uh, interesting to consider from chinese uh, um, understanding china is that maybe the chinese also don't understand right so <laughs> and that's kind of heresy you can never say that as a foreigner mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course uh, i mean um, i studied uh, ayurveda in india and it's very easy to find well not very easy uh, but it is possible to find some very good uh, ayurvedic practitioner that also teaches in india i have uh, uh, Dr. Ar Arun Sharma in, in Dharamsala and uh, it's more difficult to do to find uh, a very good practitioners of Chinese medicine that teach uh, uh, the Western uh, the Western mind. Mm -hmm. I mean I, I think you, you speak Mandarin so how important is to, to learn the language in order to study uh, the, the, the you know the, the script the scriptures and also to, mm -hmm. to learn the medicine? The language part is quite uh, important because of the relation that the the Chinese have to the Chinese character is much more intuitive than our w our Western way of understanding the alphabet, for example. Mm -hmm. The alphabet has only 26 characters. In some languages it has more, like 32, you know, different, but mostly between 26 to 32 or something le uh, letters. China has thousands, uh, you know, 75,000 characters, of, of which most Chinese people only know about three to five thousand like the uh, the ordinary people the common folk uh, well educated people know between six to fifteen thousand mm -hmm. PhD people know around twenty to thirty thousand but the relation of a person to a Chinese character is more like the, a relation that we have to a painting mm -hmm. to a piece of art so when you see a character it embodies more it's, a, it's kind of direct feeling like an ethos that you have with that character and in China they have this kind of tradition I probably you saw it 
they use uh, paint brushes they, uh, with water and uh, they they draw the same character over and over again on the concrete floor okay okay and it's a kind of uh, meditation basically of the impermanence of the character but also the idea that the the stroke is more important than the character itself is the feeling of the stroke it's a kind of uh, a kind of motion of qigong that they're doing through painting the character okay, so that this is like my level of understanding is here right um let's say that this is a uh, like a phd chinese person on on on, on ch chinese uh, literature and i'm around this this level mm -hmm. it takes you have to start from when you're an infant to kind of get get the ethos i cannot Ideally, I've yes. been there 15 years. I, I barely scratched the surface. Okay, <laughs> but that's uh, that's fascinating the way you're saying that you know uh, this this drawing of the character uh, is uh, is there is an artistic and also spiritual in the mm -hmm. moment component like a qigong, um, you know. Um, you know movement almost it's fascinating indeed and uh, i like to ask you now i mean what are your plans and uh, you know what uh, i mean why you are in pi and what's uh, you know your your your, your future like in, in your imagination i don't know i have no idea what i'm i never really know what i'm doing like part of the trip since i left china has been guided by the i ching actually because i have no idea i'm i'm just one person right now I mean, I was in a relationship before, so I'm very free, and that freedom comes with this like vast possibilities, and I don't know what to choose. So I uh, sometimes I just give you know my decision to the I Ching, like I have an intuition, but I ask the I Ching first, mm -hmm. and that's how I've been leading my journey since 2000, the, the end of uh, 2021 December. Um, I mean, I cannot tell you what I'm going to be doing next. We'll see. But you're in Pai right now, so yeah, if right anybody now, wants yeah. to meet you, I think you're a very interesting person. N not, not just uh, in terms of the knowledge that you have of Chinese medicine, but just the way you express yourself. I mean, I can see there's lots of uh, cultural and intellectual depth in what you say, so I really find you fascinating. Um, well, Juan, thank you very much for sharing your gifts with us uh, on camera, and uh, yes, uh, I hope to stay in touch with you. Yeah.